Good evening. You are watching a special episode of Agenda Wani. My name is Sintung. And starting from this Monday, we will be bringing you various discussions uh, leading up to the budget 2014 announcement on October 25th. We could talk about people's expectations, people's wish list, and today we're going to talk about education and human capital. And joining me today on set are two people very passionate about education. Next to me, I have Trisha Yeo, the Chief Operating Officer for Ideas, Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs. And next to her, we have Zamir Zukifi, who is the co-founder for Teach for Malaysia. Thank you so much to both of you for coming on the show. Now, when we talk about education, education often receives the lion's share of the budget. In fact, last year, it was 38.7 billion ringgit. But it's really not about the percentage or the money. We also want to look into the policy, execution, implementation, right? So now we already have the policy, the Malaysian Education Blueprint, which was announced just a couple of weeks ago. And the budget is coming in October. So we have the policy, the money. I'd like to start with Tricia. So where are the areas that we should be focusing on? Um, I think it's excellent that we do have an education blueprint right now. Um, it stretches over a long period of time and if you look at the document, it actually tries to be really ambitious. Um, it tries to target five different areas, you know, including access and equity, quality and so on. Um, I think the areas that we really need to focus on, of course, would be equity because you're looking at um, huge gaps you know, social economic, uh, economic gaps between people within the urban and the rural areas. Um, you know, there is access to education throughout the country, basic education, but whether or not uh, the lowest income communities are actually having access to, to quality education. I know quality is a difficult um, word to define and also that assumes that, you know, the current schools are not providing quality, uh, but I think it's safe to say that at least for the lowest income communities, um, they're also the lowest performing schools at the moment, and we really need to address that gap. So there are lots of different gaps. I mean, there's the urban-rural divide, uh, there's the geographical divide, um, there's also a divide between, between the genders. There's a gender gap there as well. Um, so yeah, I would like to, to focus on, on that equity and quality um, issue. And of course, if you're talking about the budget, uh, we need to also look at how efficient um, the money is being spent. Uh, what's the sort of returns that you're getting when government spending, say, uh, 3,000 US dollars per child per year, if I'm not mistaken, based on mm -hmm. the blueprint? Um, what's the efficacy of that amount and you know, how does that actually translate? So I'm really excited. I want to see what are the figures in the budget. Um, the policy, the blueprint is good, but I would like to see where the money will be allocated to which stream in particular? So from your end, you will actually see uh, more uh, execution in the bottom 40 percent yeah, of the... Of yeah, the, uh, I mean, um, you, you've actually highlighted something that my organization Ideas is trying to address. So we're looking at the bottom 40 percent of households in Malaysia. And in fact, we are already currently doing a survey throughout Malaysia looking at speaking to the bottom 40 percent of parents and mm -hmm. asking them what kind of issues and challenges they face when um, they have their children in schools. Um, how much are they actually spending on education? Uh, you assume that perhaps they are sending their kids to government schools, but in fact, some of them are also spending a large chunk of their household income on additional tuition, for example, which means that they acknowledge that children do need um, more than what is currently being provided to them. Which is pretty interesting because now more and more parents are spending more money to send their kids to tuition, to private schools. So. Maybe uh, Zame could share thoughts with us. Are we lacking in what areas that parents need to uh, to spend more and they feel the need that may, the quality of education perhaps uh, is not enough? Is it because of the hours that we're not spending enough in educating our kids or the quality or the teachers? What is it exactly do you think is the problem? Yeah, um, I think Teach Malaysia's stand is quite clear it's, uh, on, the t on the talent front as well, right? right. Um, so the quality of the talent, and we're not saying that there's no quality talent out there in the system. There's actually, we've actually met a lot of high quality teachers in the system, uh, but it's how do you get the best out of people? And this is a problem that you see not just in the education space, but in any organization. When it comes to managing large amounts of people, how do you, get, how do you put in the right structures and systems to get that out? Uh, so do you manage by outcomes, or do you manage processes, or do you manage activities? Uh, I like a point that Trisha brought up as well about equity. And that's something that's very, very 
uh, to the core of what we do in Teach Malaysia. We recruit some of the brightest minds, right. we train them up and then we place them in some of the most high need schools. Now we don't have a clear line of 40% mark, uh, but we use just a, a mixture of academic performance and background of the kids and disciplinary actions as well. So all that come into play. Uh, but the reason why we do it as well, it's, uh, yeah, it's good to help these kids to give them all, all equal opportunity. But as soon as, but we look at it from a, like also if you work on the lower performing or high need areas and you raise their boats and performance, then all the other kids then have to ask themselves as well, like how come I'm not performing as better or as, or as greater? So it pushes everyone's boats up simultaneously. One example that we have is one of our fellows, uh, is one in SMK Sri Desa, somewhere in Kuala Selangor. His rural school recently won third place in the national science competition. Uh, no one thought this was possible, but everyone's so proud that they made it state champions, and then they made it to the nationals, and boom, now everyone in the school and in the district is talking about this small school doing it. Guess what all the others are feeling? A pressure to push up their game. Uh, so that's the whole idea of focusing on equity. All right, so it's all about also creating that stimulating environment for education. Oh yeah, that's, that's really important, right? Like, um, I think attendance or coming to classes and um, why do the kids go to tuition, right, when they can actually st get the same, um, most of the time also, so teachers were either from the, uh, from the school system or from, not from the system as well. Um, so we, we look into ways of creating, make sure it's a fun environment, learning environment, mm. and you don't have to teach to the test, actually. Uh, what you have to do is like actually invigorate the creative juices in the kids, teach them about critical thinking, working with each other, and then they start getting excited about coming to school. And this works especially in some of the low performing classes. We all we know we stream our kids as well. Uh, that's something that I hope we can change eventually. Um, but the kids at the back always get, get written off. Uh, or they're that kind of kid, or they have huge discipline problems, so why should I help that kid, right? But that's the wrong reason. Like We should actually go there and push them more. Because you never know one of them might have actually have a cure for cancer. Right. I'd like to uh, take your point about bringing talents in, good talents, to raise the teaching profession. You said that we have the talents, but yep. it's just a matter of how can we cultivate that, uh, that motivation, that teaching, that quality. And yep. I'd like to get to that after the break. Sure. And also we look, we look at um, one of the first phase in the emulation education blueprint is also to raise teaching quality and also school leadership. Yep. And to raise school leadership is one thing, but to make it sustainable is a different thing. And like for TFM, you have the uh, corporate sector coming in to participate in sharing the responsibility of transforming the education. We look into how that model can be used. Is it working? And if it's working, how can we entice more corporate sectors to come in yep. to be part of it? We'll get to that after the break. Stay with us. Hi, you're still on a special episode of Agenda Wani, where we'll be talking about education leading up to the budget 2014. Earlier, we were talking about the uh, disparity between the urban and the rural, and we talk about infrastructure, and also we talk about quality of teachers as well. And TFM is doing a great thing, whereby you're bringing very talented young Malaysians back to Malaysia and to teach in underprivileged schools. And my question to you is, how do you get all these great students to teach in yeah. this profession which hasn't been regarded highly in recent yeah. years and that is also part of the reason why perhaps we are, are facing issues with quality of teachers. Yeah. Well actually, um, just to build on a few points very quickly, uh, Teach Malaysia is just one initiative to raise the quality of teachers because we're just getting in a small number of people. Uh, there's a broader change that needs to happen and is happening under the blueprint. Uh, what we do uh, to attract talent is that number one, we say it's very, very hard. And number two, we also say that we're looking for leaders. And number three, in these two years, we're going to make sure that you make the biggest impact possible. Um, so by saying that, thankfully, we automatically attract that type of individuals that want to make that difference, that want to focus on other things besides themselves. Uh, the biggest factors we still do have is that uh, people still think like, oh, if I do two years in teaching, then my my career is impacted or my future is impacted as well. And we have to work our way around that as well for the longer term, if we want to retain talent in education for the longer term, which is very important. How do we look at strategies that the public sector or the education space becomes as competitive for talent as the PWCs, as the CIMBs, uh, because they're there recruiting on campus day to day, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what are we doing as well about it? And I guess my, my question would be, what is it, does it, what do they want? Is it just uh, incentives or higher pay or is it more than that? Because we're looking at budget, right? Yeah. So is this just money or what is it? 
Um, I think from uh, any talent, I guess that's looking after a while that there's you can make money anywhere else, right? So and the ministry of it and most human beings when you come down to natural psychology, right? Fundamentally, people are looking for fulfillment. Like you can throw all the money at someone, but eventually they'll get bored or they won't find fulfillment in it. And the Ministry of Education has that advantage over everyone else. So I think we have the biggest competitive advantage. How do we unlock that potential and give actually people autonomy? So like you mentioned, school leadership that they're developing is that they're actually giving more autonomy to principals, which is brilliant, uh, which would then attract more people and actually they can start doing work. The tricky part is with the budget um, is that actually um, how do you then uh, rationalize the talent that you have in there? Not everyone is performing. Right. How do you get them to perform on a broader scale? And if those that after a while you supported and they can't perform, what is your exit strategy on that front? So I think with talent, we have to be very, very brutal. Uh, we have to think about what's important for the kids um, instead of sometimes for the adults. Um, we have about 1.2 million civil servants, about half of them are in the education sector. Yeah. And to transform that, it, it will take time. It will take time, definitely. And we have 12 years. And one of the first phase in the Malaysian education blueprint is to raise teaching quality. And we were talking a bit about um, how do you get the corporate sector to come in? How do you get professionals to go into a public teaching, public uh, service to teaching profession? Because it is a good model, but how do you implement it in a wider scale and to get corporates in, not just the uh, GLCs? Yeah. In the bigger picture. Um, actually, before we go into that, I, I do want to talk about that because uh, we're, we're trying to do something exciting as well on that count. But um, I think Zarmi talked about autonomy. Um, while I think the blueprint does give some autonomy and they want to do this even through giving more empowerment to the, um, the state education uh, departments and the district education offices, uh, that's, that's well and good. But I think we feel in ideas that more, even more autonomy could be given um, to the school level, uh, not just at the state or the district level. Uh, the, the two great examples, I think, which is quite revolutionary in education today, would be TFM as well as the trust schools right. um, under Yayasan Amir. And the, the beauty of these is that they are actually given um, more autonomy, I mean, especially for the trust school systems. And once public schools, government schools, are given that autonomy. Uh, they've actually shown that they can flourish. So autonomy is, is one thing, once you feel that there's a sense of ownership over the school. And secondly, I think it's also one thing common, I think, that these both systems have is a support system. Um, I think in the past, and this ties back to autonomy, the education system and policies are very driven by a central government. So it's determined by your Ministry of Education or Ministry of Higher Education in the past. Um, today they are combined. Uh, if the autonomy was given, meaning that you know more decision-making powers were given to the lower levels, uh, that also means that support would be closer. Uh, a lot closer, even geographically speaking, uh, teachers within schools would be able to to access, um, you know, strategy or be able to talk to their superiors uh, within a closer locality rather than having to go all the way to to the federal government all the time. Mm -hmm. Yes, I just but, want to jump yeah. in also very quickly. I think the, you point that the trust school is really amazing in that autonomy piece, mm -hmm. and they use existing teachers. So it's not okay. bringing any new external talent in, etc. But it's just coaching and developing, and the principal and the teachers together uh, to achieve the intended outcome yeah. as well. And, and so, if the support system is there, and the teachers actually realize that there are people um, backing me up here, that there are people who are actually providing me with a framework that I can use, mm -hmm. um, I, it's it's not really reinventing the wheel. Okay. It's actually going deeper but in. For example, Scholar yeah. Amana, the trust schools, right? You have corporate sectors to uh, sponsor and to be part of the development of the school. But these are just uh, GLCs, right? Mm. How do you incorporate yeah. to a wider corporate sector? How do you entice the corporate sector to come in? How could this budget probably lure them sure. to be part of it? Um, actually, we're, we're very interested um, to look at how the private sector can, can come in. I think sometimes the private sector is given a, a dirty name you know, for, for whatever reason, either here or, or um, universally. But I think when you see the private sector, it actually means the non-government actors. So actors and individuals within the system who are not depending on the public system, uh, but who want to partner with government and come up with funds of their own, uh, come up with you know finances that they have gained from somewhere else. So I could think of many examples. I could think of perhaps one looking at um, under-enrolled schools, which mm -hmm. there are many of around the country. Whether the 
private sector, the non-government sector, can actually take over the management of this. So maybe the role of government is actually to be more of a regulator rather than to manage those schools. Um, there are many examples of very low-cost, affordable uh, community schools, which in, in India is a bit more relevant because over there the poverty is, is, is just you know appalling compared to what we have over here. But uh, examples around the world and such models actually show that um, the private sector can come in, can either come up with a model that can work for them um, or also being able to partner with government by managing the schools that are of course given to and agreed upon by, by the government. Okay, so you're suggesting more autonomy for the uh, schools and also more participation from... For the government to play a regulator role as well, um, as I think what Trisha is saying. I think for me, my perspective is that fundraising for Teach Malaysia, we have this opportunity. We're actually struggling a lot to get a lot of... We do have some great sponsors on board, mm -hmm. but to expand and grow our program, okay. uh, we're struggling on that front. I'll get yeah. to that shortly because I need to go for the last commercial break. When we're back, we'll talk about how do you get the buy-in from the corporate sector. Sure. Hi, you're still watching a special episode of Agenda Awani. We're talking about education leading up to the Budget 2014 announcement. Earlier, we were talking about how do you get the buy-in from the private sector to be part of this, to share responsibility for the nation, national education development. Because we have, like you said, we have 10,000 schools and we have uh, Teach for Malaysia. We have the uh, Scholar Amana, whereby the private sector is in. But how do you scale up perhaps a successful model to all the other 10,000 schools, because we have 10,000 schools, we have schools in SK Carpet who have different needs, quality, uh, it, perhaps the problem is access to education, and we have school in perhaps SK Damansara Jaya, whose problem maybe is um, maybe uh, not enough uh, uh, computers or maybe not enough teachers. Yeah, so the, diff the problems are really different. So how do you yeah. find a model that is suitable? Mm -hmm. yeah. So earlier on, I think Trisha talked about the role of government in terms of opening up, creating opportunities, right? But I think like, while those opportunities do exist, uh, examples like Teach Malaysia and the Trust School example, um, what I find when I try to gain financial support for private sector donations as well for Teach Malaysia is that there's a bit of skepticism and trust. Like, why are you actually working with the government? And for us, eventually to scale up, we, or even just to start, we have to work with the government because 97% of the student population is actually in the civil service or in, in being served by the government. Like why would we want to f put our resources for just the 3%, right? Um, and then we eventually, Teach Malaysia just wants to prove success that, hey, actually, it is possible uh, to raise talent. And eventually, it should be a practice done by the Ministry of Education. And if, likewise, also, we learn a lot from the Ministry of Education. So it's a constant like relationship, constant learning process that happens. Now, where does this skepticism come from? I think it's just um, over years of everyone just facing like doing the same old thing routine. So the routine work has always been like, oh, I sponsor one child, I send one kid to university, or I give books, etc. And that's about it. Yeah, and that's about it. Which that is needed, but that's not going to push us to become the next level in our like education system. And we need to go to the core, which is a lot of things will t targeted in the blueprint. Like you mentioned, teacher training, teacher quality, school leadership, autonomy, effective. And we can actually get the private sector to train the teachers to have internship at... Um Possible as well, mm, but, but I don't think I, I don't think that's also the uh, some the training needs to be like w by the right private sector companies as well. I think the one you're talking about the broader community, uh, like what Tricia said, also non-government players. So not just the typical corporates, but also like the alumni associations mm -hmm. that are really powerful. Uh, you they can then look at also like charitable organisations that just want to get involved. Like what structures do you have for them to play? Um, mm, maybe not just teachers, even students as well. You know, we're having employers are concerned about we have. We have, they don't have enough skilled workers. Yeah. We are trying to increase our, our emphasis on vocational training, but we lack of teachers. Back to the problem of lacking quality teachers to mm. teach skills training. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's a few points that um, you were talking about just now, which I just want to respond to. Uh, one is that the trust schools that are currently uh, being done under Yayasan Amir, actually that's not quite accurate to say it's a, it's a private sector investment because it's actually under Kazana, which means that um, it's still a government GLC link, that has yes. invested heavily into this. And they have similar aspirations as government. Yeah, but you know, having said that, that does not and should not stop 
the private sector from coming in and looking at the model and how it has worked and taking it up and say that, you know, we want to replicate this model. Of course, it has to be replicated uh, well and there have to be certain standards, but we want to do this. And Has it proven to be successful, um, this model? I nice. think it yes. has over yeah. the short period that it's been implemented. So now the next step is to scale it up and to make it bigger, to get buy-in from yeah, I mean, I still have an issue with the scaling up because, you know, there are 10,000 schools in Malaysia and the objective of increasing trust schools will not even increase at that kind of exponential rate right. to reach 10,000. So I think it has to be a, a concerted effort um, from different parties, not just from uh, the GLC itself, but different interested communities that want to come in. And then one a very important community that we haven't really talked about is also the parents, mm -hmm. uh, which is why we want to ask parents what it is that they want. And if parents contribute if they are more involved in the lives and the education of their children uh, they would be able to determine as well um, and help the school you know measure what kind of outcomes they want for their children right yeah. i have about a minute left i'd like to ask what are your wish lists for the education budget this year start with zami uh my wish list i think is a lot more emphasis on merit-based performance measurements um, so really rewarding the teachers that mm -hmm. do perform and the principals that do perform through career progressions doesn't have to be more monetary. There are non-monetary rewards and recognitions that you can give um, because I think once we focus on the people that are good, then we'll get a good system. Okay. Yourself, Tricia. Uh, for myself, coming from a policy background, I really feel it's important for government to set the policy agenda right and um, not waver about, not to have inconsistent policies, um, to have something and keep it for the long term. Um, and also to be able to open up education, to allow different players to in the market in. and to be comfortable with that so that you know this does not necessarily have to be a government initiative, but government sanctioned initiative with okay. the green light. Immediate action from the budget. What do you think we can, we can use this allocation, like immediate things that you want to see? Immediate allocations. Okay. Um, allocating amounts that would allow greater autonomy financially mm. and allowing that space for schools to perhaps apply for more a bigger budget that's specific to that school's needs. Need, right. And uh, one extra point as well is perhaps to get state governments involved because um, the greatest intrastate disparities are in Sabah, Sarawak, Kelantan mm -hmm. and Penang. Of course, yes. Mm. All right, thank you so much to both of you <laughs> for coming on the show. And uh, thank you to you two for watching. We'd love to hear your comments, so drop us a line or two on our Facebook, our Twitter, and also we have um, our Astro Awani application. It's available on iOS as well as Google Play and Android. And thank you so much again for watching. And we'll see you again next Monday on another topic leading up to the Budget 2014 announcement. Once again, I'm Cynthia Ng. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Cynthia.